compatible with waking up at uh, seven in the morning. So uh, it was an experiment, but we made it here. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. I guess I, I wish we could all be together uh, somewhere, um, I guess in Moscow, but uh, it was, uh, it's great to connect virtually. Um, and I guess uh, insofar as these summer schools really serve a purpose of uh, broadening education and um, uh, connecting people, um, then maybe maybe actually the move to virtual is like overall a, a good thing for uh, society here. Um, I'm going to talk in my sessions about uh, distribution shift. So I'll start off, introduce myself a little bit, and then kind of motivate the problem. Um, let's see, make sure. Cool. So my name is Zachary Lipton. Um, I'm a faculty at Carnegie Mellon. Um, I am a joint faculty, so I uh, work uh, over with a social scientist in the business school um, where I'm faculty of operations research and I'm also a faculty in the school of computer science um, where my, my primary affiliation is with the machine learning department. And then I also associate with the school of public policy and uh, societal computing. So to give a sense of, um, the kinds of things we work on and the kinds of things we think are important and how this sort of ties into the motivation for this lecture is that overall we're concerned with actually using machine learning in the real world. So we're interested in um, um, things like healthcare. So healthcare, I, I just personally get more excited about uh, healthcare than about advertising. So that sort of was something that I anchored to early. I think now you have more options in machine learning when I started in machine learning, your options were either, uh, in 2013, it was either uh, uh, get a faculty job or work on ads. And these were the only options that were presented to you. It was either go to Google and work on ads, they hire machine learning people. Oh, there's a third option, which was, uh, you know, leave PhD and become uh, a software developer. And then you start your career seven years late and you never get promoted as far or make as much money. So now, PhD is, I guess, become a more attractive proposition um, in terms of maybe career paths. But, um, you know, I always anchored to these problems like healthcare just because I personally got excited about them. And when you start thinking about a problem like healthcare, uh, you become aware that there's like sort of a glaring disconnect um, between the kinds of problems that, um, you know, we're formulating abstractly the kinds of uh, setups were sort of developed some machinery to address and then the sort of actual nature of the decisions that we make in the real world or the, I should say probably the, the nature of these sort of envisioned applications of ML. So in general in machine learning we have sort of one workhorse that works really well which is supervised learning um, and when you start reaching into these other um, application areas you start realizing that there's um, a lot of the things we're saying, like there, there, there are some things in the real world that look almost like true, proper supervised learning problems, even in healthcare. So an example would be something like, uh, um, like uh, doing pathology from microscope images, you know, where maybe you're trying to classify something as one of, uh, you know, recognize some number of diseases and you're looking at images from a microscope and you really don't believe that what images look like are going to change over time. You even have some control over it. Like you can standardize the equipment. You can create something that looks almost like a supervised learning problem. But we're not just talking about, um, when, when you see people talk, get excited about AI and what you could do with machine learning, we're not just talking about, um, you know, maybe uh, automating or partially automating uh, just uh, pathology reports from microscope images. Um, we start talking about making decisions and you start seeing people talk about making better treatment decisions, automating things. It's always about automating things, self-driving cars, um, for example. Um, you know, you, you see, like, your, your next doctor is going to be an AI. You know, you've come to see these sorts of claims and you think, well, what does it actually take to make those kinds of decisions? And you start becoming aware of a lot of disconnects between um, the, the sort of broad brush we've painted of the kinds of applications we, where we think like AI is going to conquer and the kind of very narrow methodology that we have for addressing it. And sometimes this disconnect can become so glaring that it sort of just undermines the technology in a way where, you know, things can kind of go wrong catastrophically. So in the lab, we kind of like sit in this like intersection between like the, the abstractions we have in the machinery and the real world and try to figure out what's missing. Um, and then we use this to back up and, and then go back and do um, practical work, but also theoretical work. Um, 
So we work on healthcare, but this has also led us to look at questions of robustness. So that's what this talk is going to address. All these topics are actually more related than they might seem at first. Um, so robustness, we want models that are going to behave uh, well, not just when I evaluate them on a random partition of the original data set that I was given to train my model uh, that was selected for holdout. I want it to perform well in the actual test set, which is you know out, out in the real, real world making decisions um, in real time. Um, and you know, with all the all the various things that might change when I move from one environment to the other. The other thing is, I don't just want to make predictions. I want to make decisions, right? So I don't just want to uh, say, um, is someone, you know, how likely would someone have been to die given that uh, they presented with these covariates and that uh, a doctor, uh, you know, gave them a particular treatment? I want to be able to say, how likely would someone be to die? Uh, if, if we're the, I would like to be able to assess, I'd also like to be able to assess how likely would someone be to die if they presented with the same set of covariates, but instead of giving the treatment that otherwise would have naturally occurred in the data set, the doctor gave a different treatment, right? So in order to make um, these kinds of decisions coherently, and I believe Susan Athey, uh, who's a great economist, who's um, uh, a world authority in, in estimating these kinds of quantities called treatment effects, um, you know, is it, part of the program. It, did this become something that we care about too? And, and causal thinking, as you'll see, actually enters robustness too, because when you start talking about robustness, you say, well, the world's going to change between the training period and the test period. And then um, once you start saying the world's going to change, uh, there's a question of, well, what stays the same? Uh, because if anything can change in any way, then uh, God could just switch the labels. You know, it's like you could just have a really arbitrary, uh, basically this is trivially shown to be, you know, you don't have to be uh, like a uh, girdle to, uh, to prove that uh, learning uh, with no assumptions on how the future is related to the past is, is not possible. Um, so it's just fundamentally impossible. So then you say, well, what kind of assumptions can we make about how the past relates to the future? And oftentimes this relates to something that whether it's explicitly stated or not, starts to sound like or explicitly become in like the most formal sense, a causal story. So you say something like, well, I believe between the past and the future, uh, the amount of coronavirus has changed. However, maybe I don't, I believe there's a generative process by which someone gets coronavirus and then given that they have coronavirus, they get symptoms. And I think maybe the process by which someone gets symptoms given they have the virus doesn't change, but the marginal over the virus can change. So this starts to look like a causal problem, but instead of estimating a causal effect, we're concerned with um, a causal uh, story that relates the past to the future, where the difference is that one uh, is the result of someone having applied some kind of perturbation uh, to, the, to the distribution. So for say, an intervention in causal language. Um, uh, it won't be the primary focus of these talks, although maybe one paper that I discuss will have some implications. Um, but we, we, we also, uh, a top priority for the lab is, is thinking about sort of the societal impacts of deployed machine learning technology. And again here, um, expressing these questions coherently uh, often has this flavor that is not so unrelated as it might seem at first to questions about robustness and causality. Um, there are certain epistemic and moral questions. There's normative questions that you have, but there's also causal questions. Like when you say what, uh, when you talk about corrective justice, like I, I believe that, uh, uh, Rodrigo should have to uh, pay me to uh, uh, make up for some crime that he committed against me or something, uh, or, or, or somehow something that he did that uh, caused me uh, to lose property or whatever, I have to make an argument to the court that, um, you know, like basically that, that, that Rodrigo was the cause for me to, to be in a particular situation and therefore like restitution is... Um, is, is warranted. So, so these questions are, are often related, and I think they're related more broadly to the theme of, uh, of sort of what the kinds of problems we're attracted to, which is where like the, the problems that fall in the cracks between kind of like a, a purely sort of engineering way of, uh, you know, uh, language that we have and, and, and the actual kind of broader set of desiderata that, calcula that, that characterizes the problems we care about. Um, so, you know, we're, we're also interested in, uh, economics increasingly. And one reason why we're interested in economics is that you think, well, what are the various ways that the distribution changes in the real world? And one of them that we'll talk about now is because I think we need to, we need to start with the simplest thing and, and build solid foundations. But we're talking about this lecture, um, 
you know, towards the end, we'll, our, our, our main kind of case that we'll go into um, is when the distribution changes sort of in a passive kind of way. It, it just changes. Uh, like you're an observer, you're, you're passive. Uh, it didn't depend upon like the decisions you made or the classifiers, just that you encountered one world, now you encounter a slightly different one. Um, but often uh, in the real world, if you're deploying machine learning, even for many of the very common applications where it's actually deployed, this is not how things work. Um, it's not that the world just happens to change, it's that you actually are the cause of the change. So a great example of this is probably one of the longest running applications of machine learning is recommender systems. And in recommender systems, um, you're changing the set of exposures that a bunch of people uh, see when you change the recommendation engine. But once you change their exposures, uh, you start changing their behavior because you're actually, these people are learning, uh, they're trying to influence the algorithm, so they're trying to figure out how the algorithm works, and when you change how the algorithm works, they're going to change their behavior, and then, you know, the assumptions you made about the environment being kind of static or no longer uh, faithful. So, um, uh, when, once you start thinking about that, you say, I'm not just making a prediction, or imagine I'm giving someone a loan. If I'm giving someone a loan, uh, I make a prediction of uh, whether or not they're likely to repay the loan based on uh, what shoes they're wearing. And I decide, okay, everyone who wears Oxfords is going to repay the loan and everyone who wears sneakers is not. Um, this is going to work very well from a supervised learning standpoint, possibly, for all I know. Maybe sneakers uh, are a good feature, uh, you know, in addition to the other features that communicate something about, uh, you know, maybe the occupation of the person, which gives you some information. Um, but... The, the problem here is um, if people, if you start making decisions that way, immediately everyone else is going to go out and start changing their behavior. If you say, I'm going to give loans to everyone who uh, has Oxfords and none to anyone who wears sneakers, then people are going to stop wearing sneakers when they show up at the bank. Um, and then your model, which was accurate on the training data, is no longer useful. It has this discriminative feature that has evaporated. And the very reason is because you used it. Um, we also do a lot of work on natural language processing, and, and, and this actually kind of um, you know, tying into sort of all these other themes. So um, the, the focus for the, the primary lectures here that I'm going to go through are one, um, I'm going to go through, uh, basically I'm going to I'm, I'm sort of go through an introduction to like kind of a, a, a broad set of these kinds of problems um, and kind of situate them within a common framework of thinking about learning in the context of distribution shift. And then we're going to go really deep on one problem that I've been working on for a long time, which is called uh, uh, label shift. So the problem is uh, the label distribution changes, but the class conditionals don't. And we have labeled source data and unlabeled target data. What can we do? And what I like about this problem is it's simple enough that we can go through, we, we make this one very strong assumption, but then we can work through the entire process of um, you know, how do we detect shift? How do we uh, correct for it? Um, or how do we detect that there was shift? How do we estimate precisely what's the new label distribution? How do we uh, incorporate this information to, to correct our models going forward? And then tomorrow, I'm going to start off um, with some more advanced uh, topics that are building upon that work. And we'll talk about um, a, a much deeper dive into detecting shift, a deeper dive into correcting for it. And also various other ways that have been proposed for trying to deal with distribution shifts, maybe um, in more heuristic ways in the context of deep learning um, and ways uh, recently that we've worked on uh, incorporating human in the loop feedback. Um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Not too bad. So um, if anyone wants to, uh, the papers that I guess will comprise like the, the uh, a good chunk of the line of original work that we'll be discussed here are, are these links. So if, if, you, if you're interested um, in this work, uh, you can just sort of screenshot this or I could share the slides later. Um, so um, we've already been talking about this sort of informally, but now we're going to get a little bit more formal or not that much more formal, but you know, slightly more formal. We'll, 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 we'll ease it in. Um, but you know, this is sort of a cartoon of how machine learning uh, uh, sort of framing up problems proceeds, which is we say, uh, I live in the world where uh, God, uh, who, uh, you know, I guess was uh, best captured sometime in the Renaissance, uh, God uh, showers data out of the sky and uh, we just go and we collect some of it. And then we uh, basically make an assumption, which is that 
um, you know, we can use this data to train our model and that uh, we could just basically assume that the ident that the transition function, you know, the update function for uh, God's behavior is going to be the identity function. God is completely constant in time, is uh, not changing anything. Um, and so we, we collect our data and basically it's enough for us to just collect data today and just randomly partition it because there's no difference between a random partition, you know, the left side and the right side. There's no difference between that and past and future because we've already assumed the way anything that could change between the past and the future. And therefore, we can take a partition of our data that we collected for training and we could call it like the, the, the you know, we could just treat it as like the deployment environment. This is the, 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 the basic assumption that we always make. And so um, because you've assumed away any possible change in the world, um, you know, the, the only sense in which we then challenge ourselves to generalize is to generalize from finite samples to uh, general populations. However, we don't assume that anything can change in the distribution of the population. So um, we sort of ignore these problems of generalization of how do we generalize in a world uh, that is not faithful of assumption where, where, where God can wake up tomorrow and uh, have a change of mood and say, you know, uh, today, um, you know, God discovered Instagram today and now photographs are going to look different because um, she or he is using uh, a new filter or something. So you get the idea. Um, so we sort of need to figure out how to, to, to deal with these kinds of problems. And what I'm trying to convince you is that these problems are not, um, you know, sometimes you see a problem in a uh, paper and you say, you know, they say, oh, we took this, you know, problem and then we added this constraint and then we added that constraint and then we made this assumption about whatever. Um, and then we tried to solve it. And, and then you say, is, is, is this really a problem that exists in the world? I'm going to try to convince you that distribution shift is actually not um, a contrivance, but it's sort of the opposite. It's a problem we've all been ignoring, um, but that actually sort of plagues basically almost all, or I'd say it's the norm. Uh, uh, I'd say it's, it, it's the rule, not the exception. So uh, one example that people uh, have focused on is the susceptibility of models to adversarial examples. Um, and we'll, we'll cover this um, a bit, but not, not in as much depth. Let's give a little bit of a teaser here. You know, um, so, so everyone already knows this, I think, at this point. It's so well known. I won't go too deep into it. But, you know, there, there's this example from 2014 that started worrying people um, that uh, you, uh, you, you can take a photo. You, you can take a, a convenant that's been trained to get very high accuracy on the ImageNet data set. And then you could take the inputs and you could add a very small amount of noise. Um, and you can do this for almost any image in the data set, almost any image in the test set. You could find some noise perturbation where you add that to the original image. The result, um, and this is what scared people, is that it could be small enough that to a human, it doesn't even look like a different image. So that we wouldn't even just say that this is a similar image. Anyone would look at it and say, yes, that is the same photograph. Um, you know, they probably wouldn't even be able to differentiate left and right sometimes. And still, uh, you can induce a machine learning model to misclassify um, these images. And so on one hand, um, it's sort of like, uh, why should we be surprised? Like all we ever did, the only contract we ever signed was that if data comes exactly from this distribution, we, like, this is what it is when you calculate accuracy. When you can't calculate accuracy, what you're evaluating is the mean of a distribution, right? Like what is the mean, I mean, calculate your error rate, what is the mean of you know, the indicator function of whether or not you have an error? Um, and, and you're interested in what is it on like the uh, distribution that generated your data. When you evaluate this on, on finite samples, um, you're just getting a uh, approximation of that quantity. That's all we said. We never, we never made any kind of statement um, and the reason why you feel good about accuracy is like, because, you know, that, that actually converges really quickly. And like, it, it really is the reason why you feel good, sorry, about test set performance is it really does give you, um, uh, a really good approximate of, of that quantity. However, that quantity is only assuming that the distribution is exactly the same distribution. We never had any kind of assurance. Um, we never had any reason to believe in the first place that, uh, if we somehow, uh, go even a tiny bit outside the support of the distribution, 
um, that there isn't in the neighborhood of any, of every correctly classified image. Also, some slightly different, slightly unusual image that we were, would be very unlikely to encounter in um, uh, training that that fools the model. So, you know, I think part of what's going on and part of people being naive here is that um, when you do really good at anything, uh, you get a little drunk with power, like you, you think. So I think, you know, we do really good at classification under the ID assumption. We start saying things like human level, you know, to describe how we're doing. And then we start feeling like what we have done is human level in some more uh, substantial sense. And it's not. And so then we're really shocked when we find out that we only did really good at the thing that we optimized for. And the things that we didn't even know how to frame as problems, uh, we didn't do good at. So in some sense, this isn't a peculiarity of neural networks. That's maybe a big part of the argument that I'm making today. Um, you know, like the, the takeaway here was people, there was a lot of hype about deep learning. A lot of people said, oh, see, you think deep learning is good, but deep learning is uh, nonsense. Look, it, it's easily fooled. Um, and a lot of people were kind of like happy about this who, you know, had maybe previously been unhappy that like uh, with the success of deep learning. But the truth is, this isn't about deep learning. This is about supervised learning. And that's kind of a really important point that I want to get across. Um, so just like a little bit of a follow up here, as it turns out, these vulnerabilities are, are not limited to cases where you have, uh, um, you know, could directly intervene on pixels and have white box access to models. Um, it's also true that you could uh, come up with um, certain sorts of patterns such that you could actually um, place them on real world objects in the physical world and induce misclassification. Um, so this obviously uh, worried people that some pranksters might uh, deface stop signs or something, and then suddenly all the self-driving cars might start crashing. Um, so you know, there, there's sort of a long literature here, and we'll go too deep into it. Where basically, there's you know, there's targeted and untargeted attacks. One is where you attack the model. Um, so these are basically anticipating. You could think of you know, overall the problem is still a bit artificial, but what it sort of reveals to you is that you know. Uh, in general, you're not always in maybe these explicitly adversarial uh, settings where people are literally able to intervene on pixels. Although you could be, for example, if somebody was uh, trying to fool an ID system. Um, but you also, uh, it should make you think more generally about not just the explicit adversarial setting, but sort of any time you have an actor who uh, uh, has some kind of motives that are you know, not necessarily aligned with yours. I think the bank example is a good one here where you, know, you have strategic behavior. You're making decisions based on covariates, but you have the applicants on the other side. So if you're thinking about why is, mach is machine learning, so lots of people are trying to commercialize machine learning for resume screening. And one of the reasons why this is a really irresponsible idea, among many and other sort of ethical concerns, one of the reasons why it's a bad idea is because the whole point of a hiring policy is, is to sort of set a coherent set of incentives, right? If you start saying, if, if you find that, um, you know, the most predictive uh, feature for whether or not someone's going to be a good employee is whether they watch a particular movie. If you start making decisions that way, suddenly uh, people are going to say, oh, all I have to do to get a good job is I have to watch this movie and say at the interview that I watched this movie. Um, and suddenly it becomes no longer a good feature. Um, so the, the general premise of, of adversarial taxes, you're assuming that the underlying distribution is fixed. The, the data is still coming from whatever, but that there's someone sort of in the middle who gets to monkey with the data. And they're constrained to take a monkey with it get again you know if you make no assumptions you can't do anything they can't change data in any way but you know they're limited to some kind of threat model some class of perturbations and you want to produce a model that in general for any you know given example is you know un the adversary would be would be un unlikely to to fool you um and the um kind of standard sort of um uh, way to deal with it i mean the most effective one in practice is basically to just try to attack the model during training and only train on these uh, attack images. And just the strength of the attacker during training turns out to make a big difference. And that was the difference between the original adversarial example performance and that um, uh, uh, from, from, from PGD, from, from Maju's group uh, a few years later. Um, there's also some weird connections between uh, you know, ad adversarial examples seem to have some kind of broader uh, implications. Um, so this is some work that uh, a phenomenon that was identified by Alex Madri and that we followed up and identified in a, in a workshop paper at NERVS last year with a, an undergraduate student working with me that interestingly, when you attack uh, these images to target them to look like another class. So for example, if you take this original uh, photo of a kitten and you say you want to make it look like a custard apple, 
Um, if you do a targeted attack, so you just basically take the gradient with respect to the pixels and move them in the direction that moves a classifier's output towards uh, custard apple. Um, for uh, a vanilla just trained uh, convolutional neural network, it'll make the kitten look like just a noisy kitten. Or it'll make, uh, in the other one, it'll make the, the computer look like a noisy computer instead of making it look like a banana. Um, uh, a really weird phenomena is that if you take an adversarial robust model, one that was trained with PGD, or one that was trained with uh, alternative approach that gives a uh, sort of nice um, theoretical guarantees called uh, randomized smoothing, with either approach, uh, if you attack the image, you actually, uh, it seems, actually make it um, perceptibly look like the class, like the target intended target class. So you see over here, um, the kitten, as you attack it with either the smooth or the trained model, it actually does make it look like a custard apple. And uh, the smooth model, it even puts a face over here that's about to eat the apple. Um, uh, same here, this kitten turns into a sleeping bag. That one's kind of weird. Um, this one, it even puts a, a little man inside the sleeping bag. Um, so there seem to be some, some broader implications here, but I don't want to get too far off the path of what we really care about here, which is the vulnerab vulnerability of our models to sort of unanticipated um, shifts in the distribution. Um, so a lot of the adversarial examples, just sort of maybe by legacy or maybe because it's sort of, I think in general, maybe the dominant kind of modality in the machine learning community, and then also the one that maybe the phenomenon was originally demonstrated on. A lot of that data, uh, a lot of that uh, scholarship focuses on computer vision. Um, but this kind of vulnerability is not just limited to computer vision. And as an example, in a paper at ACL last year, uh, my student, um, uh, Danish, uh, together with Bolan and I, uh, showed that basically models are susceptible um, so state-of-the-art uh, text classifiers like BERT models are extremely susceptible to uh, so this issue with text, which is what is an imperceptible change in text? And like one, one version of an imperceptible change would be that you're only allowed to move a single character in the text. Like it's not imperceptible, like someone could see if you changed a, a B to a P or something. However, it's a minor enough change that it's sort of impossible to imagine uh, uh, a long document with a sort of overarching general applicable label where a single character is enough to actually flip, you know, what is the true label? What is the applicable label? Like if someone wrote a terrible review of a movie, you know, you can't find a single character where if you just delete that one character, just change it to one other character, um, you'll suddenly make the review positive. So it turned out that against the state-of-the-art uh, fine-tuned BERT model, um, just a single character attack is enough to uh, bring a, a performance below the level of random uh, guessing. Um, so, so, and you don't want to imagine what uh, you what damage you could do with two uh, character attacks. So, um, you know, this is sort of a, a general problem that these models are are weak against. Um, you know, the the kinds of invariance that we think should hold in the uh, natural world. Um, there's other reasons why we might be concerned about distribution shift. Um, and I just want to kind of like broaden your mindset here is um, one reason why we'd be uh, extremely concerned about distribution shift is that um, very often what we train on is altogether uh, artificial. And we're just hoping that it's representative in some way of uh, the, deploy the environment where we want to deploy the model. And this comes up in many ways. Um, one example would be physics, right? Uh, where uh, in, in a lot of the um, particle exp experiments, they've sort of simulated down to the level of like subatomic particles and um, um, the, the very sensor equipment itself. They've simulated, um, you know, what exactly should, uh, say, like the Higgs look like? Or what exactly should, uh, you know, if you've, you know, discovered evidence of supersymmetry, what should that look like? Created a bunch of synthetic data, trained a model on the synthetic data, and deployed in the real world, and just hope that the real world is, gonna, is going to look like the synthetic data, such that the classifier trained on the synthetic data can recognize this evidence of this phenomena if you apply it in the real world. Um, now, you know, you, it's not that hard to imagine how that could go wrong. Like, basically, all they have to do is get any detail of the simulation wrong. Um, in another uh, paper, uh, my student Divyansh Kaushik, who uh, um, actually got a, a Best Short Paper Award for this work at EMNLP, um, we wrote a paper that 
I, I feel like we shouldn't have been able to write, but we were able to write because of um, uh, maybe a kind of like naivete about how people were creating data sets in general, which is uh, what we did is we looked at what the NLP community has been calling reading comprehension. And reading comprehension, um, you know, uh, is uh, a sort of fancy and perhaps anthropomorphic way of saying um, not, um, you know, but basically what it really is, is question answering. It's just uh, passage based question answering. So this is differentiated from like factoid type question answering or knowledge based question answering, where someone just asks a question and you give the answer. Um, and you maybe have to hit the question against some large external knowledge base. Um, uh, instead, in, in, in QA, uh, sorry, in reading comprehension, what they do typically is you have a passage. So you have something like this passage down below. Uh, there's a bunch of spans within the passage. Um, and basically, any like contiguous span of text is a, is a candidate answer. Um, and then you have a question. And so the idea is the model should look at the question and it should look at the answer. And it should now uh, generate output. And the output is usually um, a subspan of, uh, of, the, of the article. Although there's, a few, there's several different ways of formulating these, just purely generative QA models, um, which sort of just generate by a decoding, you know, one word or one token at a time. Um, there, there's, okay, so there's word piece models. Uh, I mean, uh, decoding type approaches. There's classification type approaches where maybe you just have a, a set of 100 controlled vocabulary, 100 possible answers, and it's just classification. And you have this kind of span-based selection, I think, are the most common ways of um, setting up these problems. So, so one problem, it turns out, is that you know, these data sets are often created in an artificial manner. So one thing that people do is they'll do something like they'll take an article from CNN, They'll grab a bullet point associated with the article in like the, the, the teaser or something or the highlights. They'll grab the bullet point. They'll take that. They'll call it. The, oh, and then within the bullet point, they'll find uh, an entity using like an off-the-shelf named entity recognition system. So they'll pull out the entity and they'll call that the answer. They'll call the, uh, the, the entity list sentence. They'll call that the question. And they'll call the underlying uh, article the passage. So the problem that can happen here basically is you create a data set in this way um, and you could even tell yourself stories about how the model is you know attending to the question and the passage and then it's using you know a thousand headed attention and it's uh it's a discriminator and does blah 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 and it does all these things and it's doing multi-hop reasoning and it's connecting all the dots um but at the end of the day if you took uh at the time what were the state-of-the-art models uh you could often find that if you just deleted the question or replace the question with random words or just randomly shuffle them. So the question somehow has no information at all about the answer. Some of the models perform just as well. And so it's not clear that we've designed a task that actually is uh, reflective of question answering or even that requires uh, um, you know, uh, reading comprehension in any sense in order to complete it. And so this disconnect between the, 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 the problem we've cast um, and, and, and the real world scenario, right? It doesn't just come about when the world changes. Sometimes it's even more extreme. It comes about because our problem, you know, our training data was never from the real world in the first place. I think you could find a lot of problems that um, have this sort of phenomena in, in subtler ways where somehow or another, uh, the data set is not natural, you know? So the data, you know, keep in mind, the underlying data here is real, it's CNN articles. Well, it's not natural is exactly the way it's put together as a machine learning task. Um, so I think you could find, you know, a number of, of sort of similar uh, scary problems in the real world. Um, and again, uh, one thing that we've talked about already a lot is feedback loops, right? And this is the problem that the very deployment of a machine learning model can invalidate that very same model. So for example, um, with a recommender system uh, trained on human behavior, um, you're training it on like these traces of human behavior, but you're applying it for the very purpose of altering behavior. Um, you know, you're applying it as part of like a system of uh, behavior modifications. Ultimately, uh, that might sound like cynical or conspiratorial. That sort of is what you are doing uh, when you're one of these large platforms and you're uh, changing these sorts of primitive, changing how people, what they see in what order, whatever you're trying to get people, you're trying to influence people uh, to take actions, to click on things. Um, you know, to what, when, when we should be having that influence and, you know, when, um, you know, we, we should sort of, uh, be wary of applying the technology is I think an, an, an ethical concern and a discussion that we should have. Um, but there's no denying that when you are applying the technology, that is what you are doing. 
And of course, um, it creates these kinds of feedback loops, right? Because people behave differently when people will click on different things when they've heard of different things. They'll click on different things. Uh, their likelihood that they'll click on something might be very, very widely, depending upon how many times have you shown them the same item. So um, if you don't model uh, the, this, the, the, this, the, this sort of interaction between the system and then the behaviors and then how that, you know, in turn informs the system that you train afterwards, it's very easy to wind up in systems where you have feedback loops, where the model thinks you're going to like something, so it shows it to you more, but you're not tracking the, the role that the exposure is playing. You're just tracking clicks. So you see, oh, this person's clicking on this more. So then you think, I like it. They must really like it. And I say, I'm going to recommend it even more. And then you know, a higher fraction of their clicks are on that kind of item. And then you can have these sort of confirmatory uh, uh, feedback loops where um, they're just clicking on the things you give them. But because you're not modeling the fact that uh, you're not modeling the set of exposures, you can become blind to this. So you might ask, like, in general, um, you know, why don't we just uh, make a robust classifier that doesn't break on their distribution shift? The end. You know, let's come up with the robust algorithm, and then we're good. Um, and the, the problem, unfortunately, is that this, this doesn't actually, it's not a well-posed question. And, and I think, in general, um, this is a, maybe a big divide between, say, uh, maybe the biggest divide, I'd say, between um, like the causal inference community and the machine learning community. Is that in general, in the machine learning community, we set uh, objectives, we set empirical benchmarks, at least you know, in the practical ML world. We often see these empirical benchmarks, like we want to hit a certain number. And now we can just measure that. And then people start deploying stuff. And so we never have to ask a question about whether or not the question makes sense in the first place. If we're given the problems, they're expressed in a way where like, all the thinking's already been done for you and you don't have to think yourself. Um, but the problem here is that um, what a, a lot of these, like when you step outside supervised learning, you often encounter these problems of what we call identifiability. So there's a question of, you know, in, in this case, under distribution shift, um, there's multiple reasonable assumptions that any one of them, you know, there are real world problems that are either follow that assumption or are close to following that assumption. But each of these assumptions is going to point you to a different methodology and you're going to get out a different answer. And the data, this is the key, crucial thing, the data by itself is unable to tell you which assumption is right. So when I say the data, I mean observational data. Maybe if you go out and do experiments, you can find out. Um, that's how we ultimately uh, learn this. We get the prior knowledge in the first place. But you could have a situation where there's two common assumptions. If you make one, you'll make a certain prediction. If you make the other, you'll make a different prediction. Um, and you can't just, the data doesn't tell you which is the right assumption. So we can't just uh, sort of just say, let's just make you know, the right classifier that performs well all the time. Um, even, you know, basically, we, 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 we need to... Uh, impose some kind of structure on the problem. And then this is going to make learning possible. So um, no classifier works well in all distributions in the first place. Um, and even no domain adaptation approach works well on all structural assumptions on how domains could be related. So when you see people just saying in papers, um, we deal with a problem of robustness under, you know, in domain adaptation, um, like period, uh, you know, we, we pose this thing, there's a GAN, there's a, a MAN, there's a, you know, there's a regularizer, there's a whatever, and then it works. It, it's instantly a lie. You know, not a lie, but you know what I'm saying? It's instantly uh, an incomplete account of what's going on there. Um, you have to make some kind of structural assumption. And if you think that you haven't made a structural assumption, uh, you're wrong. You actually made an assumption uh, or there's one implied by your algorithm. You just don't know uh, what it is. You just you just weren't aware enough to think about it. So we can guarantee performance under uh, distribution shift when we have strong assumptions. Typical assumptions include um, things like bounding the divergence between the source and target distribution, um, or assuming um, shared support um, and uh, invariant conditionals. Like maybe p of y given x doesn't change over time. That's the covariate shift assumption. Or p of x given y doesn't change over time. That's the label shift assumption. So, um, right. The problem is, yeah? We have two minutes left. The 10 minutes left? Two minutes left. Oh, two minutes. Is... OK, wow. So we're just going to have a, we're going to push it all to tomorrow. OK. Yes. All right. 
Great. So um, I'll give you just kind of the, the, the beginning of the setup and then we will uh, resume tomorrow. It's going to be much more technical and we'll get through uh, algorithms and uh, follow-ups. So again, uh, no class R works well on all distributions, et cetera. Um, and the modern deep domain adaptation approaches sort of seem to offer something really intriguing, but it's sort of uh, working via unstated, implicit, or murky assumptions. We'll talk about that a bit tomorrow. Um, so um, actually, you know, well, maybe we'll end here. So, so um, I, you know, what? I have time for the motivation. So, um, so, so the, the the first work, and we'll actually go through the algorithm tomorrow. But this is just sort of the the, the motivation is is dealing with specifically label shift. So. Um, uh, label shift uh, is a setting in which um, your uh, actually let me give the motivation here. Um, here's why I care about label shift. So imagine that in August you train a pneumonia predictor, and uh, at the time the prevalence and now maybe I should change this to coronavirus. And uh, it's uh, I've had the slide for a lot you know a little while, but um, uh, I was actually giving this talk in January, like when the, when the pandemic started. So it seemed you know. Uh, maybe we'll actually have a chance to, to, to actually use this kind of thinking in, in effectively in the real world. Um, imagine that you train a pneumonia predictor and the prevalence is really low and you run it on the training data and the models, well, the models can fit the training data perfectly if you're doing deep learning. You could also post hoc calibrate it on the validation data. And if your model is you know, approximately calibrated, it's also then going to say that like 0.5% of holdout data is positive. And if you run it in the wild, you know, imagine that you go out today and you run it in the wild and you say that you know, 0.05% of the population is positive. Um, so you say, okay, the classifier seems to be working, everything's checking out. So then a few months go by, and in January, there's an epidemic, and suddenly your classifier is saying not that 0.05% of people have pneumonia, but that 5% of people have pneumonia. So it's gone up 100x. Now, the question is, when you see this, um, you know, uh, you know what, what, what should you believe? How many people really have pneumonia? So um, I'm going to do a quick poll to uh, maybe gauge where people are. Um, and then um, we, can, we can end shortly after. But um, how many people think that if you train your classifier um, and uh, you know, in a population with 0.05% positive for pneumonia and you deployed in the wild and your model is predicting 5% positive, do you think? Um, how many people think that the real number of people who have pneumonia is more than 5%? Or maybe I should do a poll and the answers are, I don't know, how to, I don't know uh, maybe, maybe it's asking too much for like a 30 second poll. Am I gonna? Huh. All right, I can't do it. Do, do they have like voting? We are we are writing the answers in the chat window, and uh, yes. Yeah, so okay, right. Most of them are going for plus, so more people have pneumonia. All right, so some people think less people have pneumonia. Some people think four. Um, something thing it depends on how well calibrated the model is. Cool. So, um, the truth is, is a trick question. Um, I haven't given you enough information to say what's happened. Um, uh, however, um, the intuition that more people have pneumonia, more than 5% of people have pneumonia um, is the right intuition, but it requires an assumption that we haven't stated. Um, so we have to make an assumption in order to be able to conclude how many people have pneumonia. Um, um, right. And the, the, the assumption that we're going to make is that ultimately our covariates, say in, in our example was like the, the, the appearance of the chest x-ray, the assumption that we're going to make is that our covariates are caused by the disease. So, you know, the, you know, the disease causes the manifestations, not that the manifestation causes the disease. And we make this assumption, and then what we say is what, what's allowed to change over time is... Um, the, the marginal of the disease. You know, what is the incidence of the disease? That could change. But we don't believe what the disease looks like changes. And if we make that assumption, then indeed we can conclude that more than 5% of people have pneumonia. And to just, you know, look at it intuitively and say, why, why is that the case? Um, 
The reason why is uh, clearly the case um, is that, well, your model was trained under a prior that said pneumonia is very rare. And so when it saw the data today, it thought that there were 5% of people had pneumonia, even though it, it thinks that pneumonia is much rarer than it really is. Right? So imagine that there actually were 5% of people with pneumonia. Your model is trained to think that 0.05% of people had pneumonia. And so your model overall is going to be underestimating because the prior is too low. So in the example that your model makes deterministic predictions and is always perfect, it's possible that exactly 5% of people have pneumonia. But if your model's not perfect, and again, assume that your model is even like the Bayes optimal classifier under the source distribution, then your model is going to be actually under, in general, underestimating. Um, you know, in the event that the incidence goes up, your model is going to underestimate. In the event that the incidence goes down, your model is going to overestimate. Um, and so, you know, this should be immediately concerning because people do this all the time. You train a model and then you deploy it in a changing world for the purpose of uh, quantification, right? Like all these people who are doing real-time uh, analytics on social media, see so like track uh, an entity and see what fraction of the tweets are positive versus negative. They're all doing this based on, um, you know, you're all doing it um, uh, like sort of like ignoring away the fact that the classifier is no longer valid once the distribution changes. And so the question is like, you know, if you trained it in a world that's 50% positive, 50% negative opinion, if it's 0% positive in the wild, do you think your model is going to predict 0% positive? No, your model is probably still going to predict what, 5%, 6%, something like that. I don't know. Um, and so, so we really need to think about this when we deploy models for this, um, these tasks that, you know, have this flavor of like quantification tasks. So um, cool. Uh, so I guess uh, that's about our time. Yes. So we. Okay. Cool. Wow. That's uh, got away from us. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we could kind of make a deep dive into the algorithms and and extensions, um, and uh, we'll see how far we can get. But anyway, great to see you all and uh, see you. Whoa, Tamara. I, funny running into you in Moscow. Cool. All right. I'll jump off. Um, see you soon. Well, have a nice evening, Zach. Take care. See you tomorrow.